Sandra is an artist and researcher working across the disciplines of sound performance, sound and video installation, as well as theory-led projects in auditory culture. She's produced works that question the political histories of the post-Soviet bloc, issues of gendered soundscapes, silencing and spatial embodiment. Her practice is embedded in feminist writing and practice, uh, specifically the works of Pauline Oliveros, Ursula Le Guin and Sarah Ahmed. She has exhibited and performed in the UK, Iceland, Lithuania, where she's from, uh, Norway, Germany, and the US. Uh, she was awarded a PhD at Goldsmiths University uh, this year for her doctoral thesis, Expanded Orality, Doing Sonic Feminism in the White Cube, which questioned how women produce sound affects the production of the gallery space in perceptual and socio-political terms and she's currently a lecturer in sound and music theory at the University of Lincoln. Welcome, Sandra. Thank you, thank you. Hello, hello. I don't think I can hear myself. Yeah, yeah, good. Um, thank you so much for uh, having me here. Thanks to Annie, Milo and Jan for such a professional uh, preparation uh, of space and it's just lovely to be here. Um, so Annie kindly has done the introduction already so just to kind of recap um, I am well consider myself an artist and a researcher and I produce different kinds of things some are more kind of theory based others are more practice-based. So I very much work within the kind of practice-based uh, remit when I approach um, my work within sound. Um, so there's no particular kind of structure or architecture to this particular talk. Um, I mean, I'm just going to continue introducing you to different approaches and different projects that I've run. Uh, but if you have any questions or comments or suggestions or examples that you want to share, please just interrupt me at any point. That's absolutely fine. But then once I'm done or if I'm just exhausted from talking because, you know, you come to a point where you feel like I've talked enough about myself. So I'm just going to stop and then we can have a... This mic. <laughs> then we can have a, a, a discussion. Um, around different things that you guys are interested in or anything that kind of you wanted to um, ask or untangle a bit further in terms of my work and my practice. So, yes, I shall begin. So why am I interested in sound? Um, as a concept, sound can feel like an abstract one. It is certainly not easy to talk about sound, um, often perceived as intangible and ephemeral sound is a complex notion open to intersubjective interpretations, directions, misdirections, uncertainties um, and discoveries. In most cases, it's physically almost impossible to touch sound. You can attempt to touching an object that releases sound. However, touching the sound itself is a difficult task. And maybe it is precisely because of this complexity that sound immediately presents us with that captivates my critical and artistic thinking the most. Sound creeps up upon us and hits us unexpectedly. It presents us with that potential unknown. It bounces off surfaces, reverberates and travels in all directions. And even when silent or hidden, it's still present with us. As listeners, we're exposed to a uh, yet unidentifiable soundscape. Some of us may be paying attention to it, whilst others might feel distracted by it and or choose to ignore it. 
The soundscape that we're hearing in the background is a recording of a sound film that I produced during my residency at Fuk Art Centre in Iceland a few years ago, and it's called Unmoored. The film itself did not contain any images yet. It invited the participant to enter a cinema type dark room and experience a composition in a 5.1 Dolby surround system setup. It invited the listeners to construct their unique narratives the space and the time in which the sounds were set. For me, sound is inherently corporeal, bodily, while simultaneously embedded in social and political materialities. Sound reveals itself through objects such as instruments, media, history, politics and social environment, and subjects, other beings, bodies that surround me in the space. I'll bring, I'll bring, but keep the songs. We'll bring it back when you have the question and answers. That's all right. Uh, sure. Get the credit. Thank you. That's much better. Um, so, con I continuously search, listen, and attend to different formations of sound in order to discover what I call the sonic in betweens. Any auditory material or matter that potentially Oh. Okay. Yeah. So. Thanks. Okay. Any auditory material um, and matter that potentially um, have been forgotten, uh, historically hidden, uh, or never acknowledged. As a practitioner, I try and continuously tune my ear, uh, my thinking, and my listening body towards the silenced the um, socially unwanted, the gestured, and the controlled. I'm interested in discovering sound as a tool for capturing political history, social relations, ecologies, and our lived environment. And it is precisely um, of this, because of this relentless exchange between myself as the creator and the socio-political and perceptual formations of sound that I continuously discover that individual artworks um, actually become possible and surface into daylight. So my hope today is to introduce you to some of the approaches I use to sound in my creative practice. Um, but before I continue, I think it's important to consider and acknowledge that there's no single or there's no one way of doing sound. Um, what this means is that sound and whether it is, um, you know, an electronically produced toned, uh, tone or sound of the wind or um, singing or an imagined sound or a sounding image or a sounding archive always serves as many different potentials of sound and sounding and something to be heard and listened to. 
Sound is a multitude that enters and leaves our individual practices depending on the context, to the ideas, the places from which um, sounds are right from and the time and space in which they're used. In other words, the way I approach sound is very much situated in the context that I embody when I create works. So, I will begin by um, sharing this video piece um, I produced for an online exhibition space called The Good Neighbor. And um, it basically serves as a summary um, of my work um, or my approach to my practice, um, which I kind of considered and explored in that particular time. The piece was produced in 2016. And in 2016, when I produced this film, What Happens When Something Happens, um, I was thinking about revisiting the spaces where I grew up um, through sonic memories. So originally, I arrived from Lithuania. Um, and I was interested because I've been in London for 14 years now and I was interested to kind of revisit some of the places and spaces I no longer have access to on a daily basis um, through sonic memories. So I navigate through these memories between um, encount uh, by encountering my grandmother um, and using the internet, so Google generated street images. So try and find or somehow revoke some of the recollections of the encounters I experienced whilst growing up in order to understand um, what I can remember. And the people, the um, gallery, online gallery that commissioned the piece, were interested to know what has inspired my practice and where I come from. Like, what, what, why do I do what I do? So I kind of tr tried to do some traveling in time and only to discover that sonic memory actually works in funny ways and it presented itself through rather um, chaotic sound structures rather than um, any clear linear narratives. So ooh, let's watch this. Yeah, 
ne blogai dainuojam, ne. Ar užsimenė Sandrų tiek, kad vis apsiremdavot visokiais ilgais, sužuolodom džiuloje, iššokdavot laukia, susikvietus jos su visas draugės, tai būdavo smagu. Bet kaip čia man tos jono nepateisė, ko jos visas matosi? O ką jau reikėjo padaryti jaunui? Vis tiek galėjo pasakyti, kad pasitvarkytų. Čia tą pašą dieną ir prie pilies ir šičia mes per visą dieną jį dainavau. Tas visas dainas. Atbėlė kaimynė ir sako iš kitos laipinės. Ar sandrutė nei jau suonu, kai sakau, mano. Sakė, nusivedė kažkoks tai dėdas, jie sako. Aš labai įsidendau, bėgau. Ir sūnus Petras buvo kaip tik bus mane atvažiavęs. Jis mane pralenkė ir pasivyrė tą dėdą su tadiu. Sako, ką dar reikau dėl vidėsi tą mergaitę? Sako, tai aš būčiau atveradęs į atgalų. Two different formats of sound in order to discover the intricacies of audio material that potentially have been gotten or never acknowledged. I'm interested in the potential sound tool of capturing and shaping political histories and social situations. Thus, appropriate forgotten sound audio, collect recordings, and construct audio visualization. In order to understand how sound effects are being world, I gathered as videos, old with an incentive to revisit and think history, personal and collective memories, through performances, compositions, and installation work. I seek to juxtapose history with the present, techno-mediated objects with the experience and lived subject, sonic with visual material. And more. So thank you for watching that. Um, so to summarize, um, when working with sound, I engage um, with sound in the following ways. Um, uh, I create sound uh, and audiovisual installations, um, placing physical sound and 
visual objects in gallery spaces and museum settings. I perform sound um, in solo, uh, but also collaborative environments where I use different musical and non-musical objects, field recordings and different sonic media such as cassette tapes and recorders. Um, I curate um, sound-based um, shows and uh, performance nights as well and I research sound so I write about sound in different kind of cultural contexts um, and my primary theoretical interests lie within um, sound space and gender debates. Um, and when creating works I use the following media tools and techniques including field recordings, I work a lot with archive, um, both sonic and audiovisual archives as I'll discuss um, later on by sharing some of my um, works with you. Um, mentioned already cassettes and um, uh, tape recorders and four track recorders so anything that I can get my um, hands on uh, is easily accessible. Um, so very quickly I would like to um, discuss or talk through the kind of more conceptual rationale and my approach to what I call expanded sounds and expanded sound in art. So um, um, I believe that uh, and I argue for that art has always been audible, just not necessarily attended to by ear. So from the boisterous formation of the earth, um, uh, formation of crust rock and liquid water to the sound of wind hitting um, polyolithic caves and carved rocks, to the ambience of church acoustics, and the eerie silence in early museums, sound has been an inevitable agent contributing towards the formation and experience of art in perceptual and aesthetic terms. So in this sense, um, any art, whether it's a painting or still photograph, um, is always and has always carried a level of sound. Um, its sonic dimension might be muted, uh, but still, either um, in the physical presence or through memory or through the ambience of the space, we will experience sound um, in one shape or form. And as a result, the sound uh, will carry itself um, through the artwork as well. So in my artistic practice, I question this kind of tension and the struggle between the auditory and the visible. And partly with my research as well, I confront the history that teaches us that vision is our most primary and intelligible sense. Um, and I question those rational forms of knowledge that tell us that to trust the eye of uh, any other sensing element of our body. Um, and time and time and time and time again, philosophers have told us that um, sight, unlike hearing, touch or any other senses, brings us closer to the ideal. Um, it offers us ob um, unquestionable objective truth. And as we can see, um, in the quote from Aristotle in the opening of Metaphysics, he wrote that we prefer sight. Sight best helps us to know things and reveals many distinctions. So in my practice, um, whether it is installation art or live performances, scores or curatorial work, I try and move away from this form of kind of determinist thinking and telling and by conceptually exploiting sound in relation to moving images and space um, in different kind of technological and perceptual constructs um, 
I try and confront the called so-called uh, visual centric uh, forms of um, knowledge and experience and I invite the participants um, of my works to experience the artworks um, and experience um, the sounds played without any sensory kind of boundaries or borders but always as sonic as well as visual and always in connection and interplay with each other so I kind of promote um, and encourage this idea of audiovisual participation and whole body participation in works um, and when making works I play with um, the idea of mediating time and space um, as well as gender free sound um, and to kind of summarize, do I still have them? Yeah. So just to summarize my conceptual thinking and practice uh, with my works, I try and kind of um, rediscover um, and reappropriate forgotten sonic media in different kind of political contexts. So some of the works I'll share um, uh, particularly address the. Um, certain political histories that I try and kind of entangle, um, unentangle through um, different sonic media that I use and kind of dig into archives in order to understand how the history has been told and retold again. Um, so I collect field recordings as a way of learning about the environments we inhabit and then I create compositions out of them and installations. Um, So, quickly about inspiration. So we all um, take inspirations from something or someone. Um, it's kind of a given that we're always inspired by the things that we experience, but also by the people we read, um, by the sounds we listen to created by other people. Um, and my work is very much uh, embedded in different kind of sonic thinkers and practitioners, including, as Annie introduced kindly, um, Ursula Le Guin, uh, Oliveros, um, also video artist Joan Jonas, and uh, Liz Rhodes. So my most recent writings and practice um, has been very much inspired by a science fiction writer, Ursula Le Guin, her thinking and her ideas around the mother tongue and the father tongue. Um, and there, there is a particular piece of writing that she did, uh, a speech that she gave in, in the 80s that I found quite inspiring, um, where she told very briefly about her encounter with um, composer uh, Paulina Oliveros. And she wrote, Early this spring, I met a musician, the composer Polina Oliveros, a beautiful woman like a gray rock um, in a steam bed. And to a group of us, women who were beginning to quarrel over theories in abstract, objective language, and I, with my splendid Eastern women's college training in the father tongue, was in the thick of the fight and going for to the kill to us. Paulina, who was sparing with words, said after clearing her throat, offer your experience as truth. This sentence resonated with Le Guin, and in reflection she wrote, there was a short silence, and when we started talking again, we didn't talk objectively. We didn't fight. We went back to feeling our ways into ideas, using the whole intellect, not half of it talking to one another which involves listening. We try to offer our experience to one another, not claiming something, but offering something. And this kind of quote really resonates. Well, it resonated once already, but it continues to resonate um, in my practice and my thinking. And just to go back um, to this sentence where she writes, Offer your experience as truth kind of allowed me to build and understand my own agency as a bodily kind of subject in the world. And it 
inspired me to kind of voice out my ideas and my approaches to the things that I experience with confidence. So Le Guin and Oliveros were able to talk in a language they both shared, a language that sought to offer something rather than claim something. And this language, as Le Guin um, calls it, is mother tongue. For Le Guin, the mother tongue is the language of a relation, a relationship. And, it, and um, Ursula Le Guin writes, it connects and it goes two ways, many ways, and exchange a network. And those who speak it do not aim to divide or separate. Those who live by it um, do not speak at you, but with you. And this um, precise speaking with you will come back in my practice in one of the artworks I'll share with you in a moment. So speak with you and all of you, your body, your limbs, your ears, your eyes, as well as your surroundings. So mother tongue, the way I perceive it, is a language of embodied collectivity. It encompasses more than mere words, but includes gestures, bodily presence and movements, and the lived environment. It is a language that allows those who speak it to listen, to experience, to be with one another, to form relations and to build knowledge together and to offer something rather than claim something. Paulina Olivera's practice um, reflects Le Guin's thinking and the notion of the mother tongue. Uh, Paulina Olivera, I'm sure some of you will know her work quite well, introduced the concept of deep listening. And since the 1960s, um, Olivera's was very much an activist and she um, sought to engage her whole body um, as a performer as well as a listener to sounding environments and considered her practice as not purely an aesthetic kind of um, form but as a social act. And this approach has enabled the artist, to quote Oliveros, to take in and listen to everything that is audible around you, including inside of you. For Oliveros, the idea of engaging in everything that is audible and is inside of you that is audible has empowered her to consider orality um, in more socially co-connected terms. Imagining listening not as a directional act or an isolated practice, but a communal a shared event. So I find this form of thinking extremely useful and I apply it in my practice when creating works um, and writing about sound. Um, Liz Rhodes is also um, one of the many other inspirations that I turn towards when thinking about um, the tension between image and sound, the tension between hearing and seeing, the tension between visuality and orality. And Liz wrote, um, British video artist, um, used visual medium such as like celluloid film as an auditory instrument and with the idea of expanding uh, listeners' perceptions um, when participating in sound and audiovisual installations in gallery settings. So she would um, transform film stock into um, scores, sound scores, which she would then compose um, using um, hand-drawn technique, inscribing sound, drawing sound directly onto celluloid film. And this method is called optical sound. Um, and the idea was to expand the possibilities of the visual medium beyond vision itself. Also with the idea of obstructing the representational nature um, of 
um, film. So when thinking with and through sound, um, she used this particular technique to interfere with the heightened visuality um, and consequently challenging its limitations. And once again, um, what is going on there? It'll become more evident. Why? Her work has been. There we go. Why her work has been. Um, uh, quite important part of my practice. Um, so just kind of quickly to summarize the um, inspirations and sonic thinkers that have inspired my work. Um, is that when thinking about the practice, I call the works and her engagement with the artistic uh, sound uh, in artistic terms as sonic feminist acts. And um, I will return to this idea later in the talk. Um, but for now, I would like to present some of the works um, and the methods I have developed um, and have been develop developing in my artistic practice and research practice inspired by um, these sonic feminist thinkers. So Expanded Soundscapes is an ongoing um, project, is a series of um, visual scores um, composed for field recording compositions um, that I have created in different um, spatial contexts in different places. So the project is very much inspired by the ideas around mother tongue and deep listening um, and this kind of idea uh, around sound as a collective um, relational practice. Um, so the project explores the notions of listening with and embodying with through visual graphic scores. And it translates my experience of listening and embodying different uh, places from Icelandic um, landscapes to Soviet architectural buildings into um, visual field recording compositions to be interpreted and performed by listeners and sound makers to be read and imagined openly with no restrictions. So due to the abstracted and non-linear nature of the scores in the spirit of Oliveros and Le Guin, Invite the listeners to use their bodies as instruments as well as recorders to immerse um, themselves in the whole um, of the space-time continuum of perceptible sound with the hope that a more open and social interconnection between the listener and the environment can be formed. So whilst these um, um, scores have been kind of created with the intention for any sound makers or listeners to um, play and explore through field recording. They're also open to any forms of other interpretation. So by allowing ourselves to um, use our bodies to immerse in the visual scores as well as imagine them and perform sound, whether it is the sound of a waterfall in the southern part of Iceland or the soundscape of an abandoned silk factory um, in a post-Soviet um, block in Eastern Europe. We can, through bodily listening, I believe, heighten and expand our understanding of at least the sonic aspects of the world. 
I would consider this project in line with um, the kind of inspirations that I've shared, um, a sonic feminist practice. And it is a route towards escaping those kind of rational forms um, of knowledge or the, wo the, the, the way we kind of understand the world that is taught to us. Um, and Le Guin refers to this kind of language as the father tongue, the language of power, social power. So um, this kind of practice is an attempt to somehow uh, form um, a response to that um, father tongue and in the language of the mother tongue to kind of open our possibilities of engaging with the environment. So these were the series I developed for um, and in Iceland during one of my kind of residency research um, uh, times that I spent a few years ago. And these graphic schools were developed in response to visiting um, different architectural buildings in um, the post-Soviet bloc in Eastern Europe. So these scores try to invite the listener and the performer to imagine um, the sounds that are being portrayed within the images and to make them sounding, whether it is through their bodies, um, the objects that they find along the way or just purely by listening and imagining the sound of that particular environment. And the idea is that each expanded soundscape then will exist as unique to the bodies and to those experiencing it and performing it. And these are some of the other graphic scores I've produced for different contexts. Um, this particular one is for um, theatre play that was performed by um, four actors on stage and um, a choir as well. I've used sound as a tool for ecological thinking or thinking about environment and produced um, an installation called Oasis, uh, which was exhibited at Call and Response um, in London uh, in 2016. So Oasis is a um, multi-channel installation um, and it was... Um, composed using uh, actually a 14-channel setup that the um, gallery space offers and has installed um, as a permanent um, thing. And hopefully, um, maybe some of you will be able to pay a visit to it um, because it's just based in Deptford and uh, they're always quite keen to kind of get uh, students involved in and use the space for educational needs as well. So the artwork um, uh, tried to question and think about what our imprint is um, or connection with nature is. Um, it sought to um, create a potential escape from noisy and loud urban environment that is London. Um, 
so sculpture becomes um, an oasis ground, um, a man-made area that I have created, uh, inducing um, a constructed kind of quietude um, that one is welcome to enter uh, if needing an escape. Um, and the installation um, allowed the visitors to immerse um, in what we usually perceive as natural or of nature, even though it's not necessarily um, naturally constructed. So the actual installation consisted of um, two screens and uh, many, many different plants uh, that were spread across the space. And the 14 um, channel setup was surrounding the um the installation um so whilst um the artwork kind of tried to create uh, a space for escape from the um unwanted sounds and urbanized sound environment um yet quickly um it becomes um, audible um, through the kind of soundscape of the piece itself that the participants imprint on the o oasis ground that has been created for them becomes inevitable. And whether it is through bodily movement or human-made unwanted sounds, the sculpture slowly but eventually transforms itself into a site of imminent noise. So through moving images and sonic composition, the natural setting becomes a site of human production. And whilst developing the piece, I kind of did a lot of research in terms of like um, blogs and websites that people go on to, to look for advice where to um, travel to, to escape the kind of, um, what they call it, contaminated or urbanized environments. Where can I travel to, to experience um, nature in its purest? Um, and kind of collated a number of blog posts and um, different kind of responses on threads and websites where people share their ideas where they can travel to. So this one um, is by an anonymous writer that was found online that says, I can no longer cope with noise. I need an oasis to escape to, a pleasant, quiet and peaceful area, away from the deafening car engines, construction sites, planes, trains, traffic, office noise. Gosh, I don't know what's wrong with me, but I need a break away from it all, visit a remote nature park or whatever. Can someone recommend any good or cheap nature resorts I could visit? Um, so the idea was with this piece to explore, like whilst the nature is crumbling, we continue to concentrate and prioritize our well-being. We demand an oasis to be created for us. And our understanding of what nature is as a result and what is supposed to serve from a human-centric perspective has led to these further exploitation of natural territories, transforming uncultivated, south, uh, uncultivated sites into um, holiday parks and resorts, um, in a way kind of leading to this idea where nature becomes a form of commodity exploited by hum urban infrastructures, regeneration plans, airlines and travel agencies. Um,
just a very short snippet, a close up of what the experience was like. Um, and just to kind of summarize the rationale for this um, piece, it kind of tried to point out that we are desperately, constantly wanting a piece of nature um, to escape to, but question whether kind of um, nature wants us um, in a very kind of broad and holistic terms. Um, <laughs> Another um, art piece uh, installation that I developed, um, and I use sound as a kind of tool for political questioning, and this is um, where I mentioned that I work with archives. This is where the archival material became quite important. Um, so this particular piece, 13191, um, it's um, an audiovisual installation. Um, that sought to revisit a spe specific political conflict um, that took place in now independent Lithuania, where I'm from, uh, then still USSR. Um, so using what you know we could consider a media archaeological approach, um, it interrogated the um, last uh, protest before the dissolution of the Soviet Union, um, which took place 13 of January 1991, during which the USSR army tanks entered the country and killed 13 protesters and injured over a thousand people. Um, and it was our last attempt to escape the Soviet regime. And what I found interesting was that the event uh, was captured by non-professional camera users using video um, um, VHS cameras at the time who uh, collated a huge archive um, that followed the events of the whole event from start to finish. So there's hours of it. And, and as a result, um, this kind of immense audiovisual archive was collated and it just sits there. Um, and I decided to revisit this archive and I started looking at it and I was particularly intrigued in the uh, kind of individual protesters' faces and their expressions um, and their lives actually caught on the medium, but because the video um, material kind of managed to capture uh, footage of thousands of people who were present throughout the day, all of these kind of um, subjects caught on camera um, can only be witnessed and experienced in fleeting and passing. So I was really interested to kind of try and stop, or try and stop and like focus on these individual protesters, faces particularly protesters who were like elderly women providing food, um, for men kind of barricading the main um, areas in the city. Um, and I just wanted to understand the kind of intricate subjectivities of each individual protester. So to do that, I decelerated the both sound and the video and slowed the images and sound down to its maximum. Um, in order to kind of extract some sort of um, affective potential from their faces. And this is uh, one of the exhibition views. Um, so this piece exists as kind of multi-channel um, installation and originally I created it for four screens and four channel sound but the screens have traveled actually elsewhere and sometimes um, people ask me to send just one screen and um, you can see that the screen at the back is actually um, a sculpture of um, Lenin, here it is, and it's um, an image captured from the um, from the uh, audiovisual archive of Len's statue being slowly like taken down. So that one's quite popular. 
Um, and the screens are usually just scattered around. And the piece works both as a silent piece, but also as um, an audiovisual piece. Uh, and there are moments um, in the um, artwork where the sound of the protest becomes unbearably loud, whilst at other times is decelerated to its maximum. And what I realized after trialing and experimenting with the sonic aspect of the piece, that once is really, really slow um, and played back, uh, it kind of produces like very um, almost nausea-inducing um, uh, visceral effect. Um, and this is what it sounded like. So this is the very loud, noisy part of the... This is the sound of the same protest, but slow down, decelerated to its maximum. So you can imagine with the subwoofer being present in this space, this kind of the low frequency sound becomes very um, present. So in the end, this installation, the way I kind of tried to describe it, um, served as a form of kind of historical and political intervention in time. It kind of wanted to understand how um, the history that we were taught whilst growing up um, changed with um, such a specific political event happening in time. So with the protests and then with the solution of the union, um, the way we understand history or the way that we start learning about the history, it changed. So with this particular event, it almost felt that a, some sort of rupture, historical rupture took place. So I view sound as a tool also for mediating time and space and I produced this artwork called Airport um, which also served as an audiovisual installation and it um, aimed to connect two particular sites, so um, a gallery space in London with an airfield um, which you can see in the background, um, located in Lithuania, again, um, the place of my birth. And what I found interesting about this location was that this airport was built um, by the Soviets during the USSR occupation, and it's located in this quite unique bit of land that's kind of connected to the mainland, mainland kind of not. Uh, it's a very kind of thin, narrow strip of land um, that is connected to Kaliningrad, um, Russia. And it is quite hidden. It's hidden between forests and sandy dunes, the sea and the lagoon, so it's not that easy to find. Um, 
but it was abandoned. It was built in the 60s and it was abandoned during the dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1991 and has not been really used ever since. I mean, sometimes you get um, uh, some kind of small planes uh, randomly landing, but I'm not sure how legal that is. Um, so since then, um, this kind of human-built construction has been resting quietly um, and waiting to be unearthed by someone or somehow. Um, almost kind of the way I perceived transforming into this um, interesting cement type structure, sculpture, uh, hidden between all the kind of natural habitats surrounding this um, space. Um, and I wanted to bring that space to somehow, to mediate that space into the gallery in London. Um, so I decided to create this kind of um, structure that um, would somehow try and connect the two places in real time. Um, so using a row uh, scattered in, in this context, eight video monitors and Have we lost the footage? Okay, I think we're back. It just sometimes seems like it's um. Mm -hmm. um eight video monitors and four channel sound to um. Uh, somehow kind of connect the two landscapes um, in real time. I mean, the, the initial idea was to um, transport also the sound of the gallery, the ambience of the gallery, into the natural site. But that did not happen because when I was constructing the piece, um, um, it was a nesting season and the um in Nida, um so the location where this was set, and because it's a UNESCO protected site, um they are very careful about what kind of imprint we create, so um instead, it was kind of a one way um transportation from the um Nida gallery site into the gallery site uh, sorry from Nida to gallery site here. Um, and this is what it sounded like and looked like. This particular piece was exhibited alongside uh, 11 other artworks and I'm going to talk about that in a second because it's a project that I curated, um, a group exhibition of sound and audiovisual works. So we can hear the presence of other artworks as well, the sonic presence of other artworks in the space. So very quickly, I'll just talk you through some of the curatorial projects that I've done um, as a part of my kind of engagement with sound. And um, Sound Place was an exhibition that was exhibited actually at Goldsmiths in 2015 at the St. James Hatcham Church. Um, 
and it wanted to explore kind of the non-linear and boundless and leaky nature of sound um, as a way kind of of exploring how sound can be shared between artworks without necessarily uh, dividing them. So the question that we raised was, can we create a conversation between artworks? Can we, basically, how do we deal with the politics of sharing sound in a shared space? Um, so um, 12 artists, sound and audiovisual artists, were invited to work together in the building and to kind of form discussions around like how uh, different sound artworks can actually communicate in space and whether they can form a coherent composition rather than a kind of chaotic, uh, um, I don't know, chaotic thing in the end. Um, so we were very adamant that we're not going to build any um, partition walls, so all the sound um, artworks would have to somehow um, to converse with each other. Um, there would be no acoustic or visual barriers and the leaky collaborative acoustic environment um, requires the sound of different artworks to intermix and to connect. Um, and it was an experiment. So it was an experiment. We weren't sure whether that would work, but um, I think in the end, um, some conversations were struck, and um, it was more of an interest to have this kind of um, conversation and working progress and working through the issues of how to um, curate sound and how to exhibit sound in a way that um, does not have to be divided or somehow removed, but it could be um, shared uh, and coexist together as a collective. Um, and in the end, it worked. Um, so that was the kind of plan of the space and um, this particular room was a separate room for performances but all of this kind of area was just one shared space um, with no walls kind of separating them completely. And again, the kind of video material is there but it's quite... Um, close up -y. don't get the sense of the whole environment but at least you can hear the sound of different pieces kind of working together Another project I curated as a part of Kona's Biennial in Lithuania was an, um, another group show that invited um, 
sound artists to collaborate with visual artists producing artworks um, that would respond to different locations and architectural buildings that they um, visited during their time in the build up of the exhibition. So specifically we chose to explore um, now closed um, uh, different textile factories because um, Konas, uh, the town city, sorry, in Lithuania, was famous during the um, Soviet times for its uh, textile industry and the main kind of um, produce came from this particular city, but um, and there were lots of factories across the city, but those were closed down um, during the 90s. Um, so we explored those um, spaces. Um, we looked at different kind of materials that were left, and some of them, you know, still have um, offices filled with um, different furniture and different paperwork. So everything is almost like something happened and they had to leave overnight. So we entered those spaces and kind of use some of the material or recordings and then artists develop artworks um, in response to them. And uh, using kind of the city's um, architectural heritage um, as the main source of inspirations, um, they worked in collaboration to produce different installations and use those conceptual encounters um, as a way of exploring the notion of co-temporality, um, a possibility of extended time or coexistence of multiple temporalities within the present time in relation to sound memory in the space um, through kind of um, more theoretically based discussions, but also through experimentation and practice. Um, and some of the artists came from, you know, um, Croatia, Greece, Norway, and they brought their own kind of understanding of space and memory and tried to kind of connect to the histories and the present of um, the place they inhabited for the duration of the exhibition and the build-up of the exhibition. And different performances were constructed um, on installations. Um, but uh, this was just, I wanted to briefly introduce to kind of uh, my curatorial approach and another way of engaging with sound in both research and also practice terms. Um, sound is research. Uh, I'm going to skip this and talk about maybe uh, another interest of mine is the soundscape work that I develop and one of the projects um, that I've kind of been working on dipping in and out whenever I have time is the soundscape of the post-Soviet world. Um, and I would call it mm, uh, uh, an observational project, um, ethnographic, a diary of some sorts, um, that kind of is interested to capture the contemporary soundscape of the post Soviet countries and I use field recording and the sonic diary um, as a way of questioning how those contemporary soundscapes unveil themselves and reveal themselves within this kind of still newly formed societies and how they're experienced uh, today uh, in relation to how they were experienced in the past. So for example, this um, particular image in the background is of um, city center, the main street in the city where I grew up, Konas, and used to be um, a site for kind of cultural and social exchange, used to be really, really vibrant place. And um, this 
interesting building in the background um, was a department store and it was uh, knocked down maybe 10 years ago, uh, maybe 15 years ago, and since nothing else has been built to kind of replace it. So the once really vibrant um, part of the city has now kind of become uh, a real, um, well, a site of abandonment, really. There's not that much um, sound that can be discovered there. And uh, I've got this place in the background. So this is what it sounds like now. But what I found interesting through the kind of walking and listening and collecting the soundscape, uh, soundscapes in the city, uh, realizing that um, instead uh, the developers built a massive shopping mall just 10 minutes uh, away from the um, main city center. Um, and that's where the action is, that's where the social interactions happen, that's where the kind of people go to consume and socialize and exchange um, kind of their experiences, whilst this place that used to serve something really, really culturally important has now um, sounds as that. So what's happened that the soundscape kind of shifted from one place to another. And now sounds like this. Um, and very quickly, last thing I would like to um, share with you uh, today is a kind of my approach to sound as a form of collaboration and whether that is uh, through um, working with different artists and sound performers, creating radio programs and um, attending group residencies. Um, and I've just returned from um, a group residency that was called Field Kitchen um, in Germany. Um, and I spent three weeks there developing different um, collaborative projects and solo projects and focusing on my music. Um, but it was a very kind of useful experience and um, uh, an experience that kind of drove me to uh, develop new ideas and projects and really um, revitalizing kind of time, need a time for <laughs> any practitioner to kind of dedicate uh, in terms of um, conceptual and artistic growth, kind of removing yourself from the day to day, from the routine and allowing yourself to just kind of embrace your 
creativity in a dedicated space and whether it is for like solo residencies or um, group residencies and just immerse in the making, immerse in the thinking, immerse in the doing. Um, and it's extremely healthy for any artist to be that selfish and to kind of sometimes disappear and just focus on the, you know, the things that you want to be doing that sometimes are pushed out from us because of routine and workloads. So during this time, um, I kind of tried to explore the idea of mapping spaces for sound onto other spaces. So um, <coughs> we worked with different artists um, over the course of um, three weeks um, and um, created weekly kind of presentations and showcases to the local uh, um, people of the area. And for the first week, I developed this kind of small installation work where I decided to um, map my mom's kitchen uh, onto a field on the residency side. And to begin with, I thought like, oh, how should I, how should I go about it? Should I actually like place different speakers and kind of create um, some sort of sonic architecture? But then I realized, actually, I'm just going to um, contain my mom's kitchen in a tape recorder. So I composed, um, well, I created the composition um, that kind of summarizes my mom's kitchen. And I tried to kind of spatialize it in a, um, in a four kind of uh, corner slash four channel sound way. And then placed it in a tape recorder. Um, and again, this kind of resonates my um, interest in sonic memories and how we remember spaces, how we remember um, our daily routines are no longer with us. And for me, my mom's kitchen was a um, very important place. So I just wanted to kind of think about how she potentially could remember it as well. And I like the idea of like two uh, places and two spaces coexisting at the same time, so we are still kind of um, located in a kind of residency site, but also transported to another time and place that's mapped. In addition to that, because um, we were very productive, um, we did a lot of kind of live um, experimentations and improvisation sessions um, pretty much on a daily basis. And some of them were really, really successful. just through play and through experimentation and through spending time together with um, practitioners who come from very different backgrounds, some are cello players, some are work with um, uh, Maxim SP, others um, modular kind of synthesis. Um, we um, formed collaborations and potentially um, uh, future projects and future kind of work that we're going to be developing together. Um, and none of that would have happened if we kind of didn't meet.
We were also lucky to have a very um, sonically interesting architectural structure on site. Um, this very tall um, silo that produced great acoustic effects um, when in the space. So we, I kind of spent some time um, just playing out some of the recordings that I did um, and just spending time with the space. just recorded the sound of the space um, and then kind of used it back as a material in um, compositional works. And um, uh, accidentally, um, we um, also formed a rock band with, <laughs> <laughs> whenever I mention it to people, it's um, yeah, a bunch of artists decide to join uh, to form a rock band. Uh, but this is, um, uh, f uh, an image of us performing rocks. Um, so it was very kind of um, funny moment where we were in the space and just discovered a bunch of rocks and we decided to start playing with them and it just it just kind of it was quite impromptu, quite um, unplanned event, but it just seemed a right thing to do. There was a bunch of us um, four women just uh, climbing on the rocks and then just slowly kind of performing together and it was improvised um, but felt quite powerful and there were moments where some of us were really struggling to kind of um, stick to the rocks and just almost like falling off and then others kind of jumped in and held the other one so it became kind of like very communal shared experience of us kind of somehow struggling for some reason but also you know feel like we have to continue um, to kind of play these rocks and stick to them um, so since we've kind of been developing um, a performance out of it and we hope to travel the world as a rock band carrying our rocks everywhere we go <laughs> Um, I'll stop there because I've been talking so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sandra, for sharing your practice with us. Um, so rich and there's so many elements I think it will resonate with many people here. Um, I have loads of questions and things that I could ask you, but um, I'd like to open it up. We've got uh, about 20 minutes or so uh, for Q&A. Um, yeah, has anyone got any responses or questions? Um, I think Sandra's work brings up a lot in terms of memories, affects, Place, temporality, <laughs> space, the politics of connectedness, corporeality, embodiedness, all these words <laughs> that you mentioned that are kind of big, heavy concepts. But I think what's really nice is that um, your process, which is research-led or kind of researchy in the way that engages with theories and ideas, but it's not burdened by kind of theory. It's just feeding off it in a really mm -hmm. wonderful and kind of vibrant, very generous way. Um, yeah, I really love the idea of kind of um, the Ursula Le Guin interaction with Pauline Oliveros and offering your experiences your truth. And I think that's something that everyone here as a kind of sound practitioner or budding sound artist or however you want to define yourself, something that they everyone can explore for themselves. Um, and really powerful kind of concept to take 
for oneself as an artist. Does anyone have any comments or questions for Sandra? Or responses over here? I think I will run over here with the mic so everyone can hear you. Hello, thank Hi. you for coming in today. Um, what kind of responses have you um, had from doing works about political history, like the Soviet Union um, background of your kind of history? What responses from your works? Uh, responses in terms of just people experiencing them? Yeah, mm. yes. Um, it's an interesting question. Um, very different responses depends on the kind of context and the place that they get to be exhibited um, in a kind of Western uh, context. Um, everyone's quite fascinated because uh, these are the sort of histories that are not really taught or not really discussed, and um, for them, it's quite, I suppose, educational. It's like a lot of people like, oh, I didn't realize. Oh, is it 1991? Oh, it's oh, Lithuania. Is that a country? Um, so um, you get this kind of rather superficial response. And sometimes you get more interesting kind of um, conversations with people where um, it almost um, uh, revives their own histories. Um, so then it becomes like a, a space for sharing and exchange. But like I've had conversations with uh, people who come from, um, you know, the more kind of southern um, post-Soviet bloc countries in Serbia, um, Croatia, and it's been really interesting to kind of exchange the intricacy, intricacies and differences in terms of how the struggle took place um, but in a very productive way um, back home um, um, the response has been um, quite effective actually because I feel like these are sort of histories that even in the local context we don't really spend or dedicate enough time to um, untangle um, and I don't know whose fault that is um, but since the kind of the break of the union, there was a very um, immediate shift towards um, the Western kind of ideology and the construction that we need to become like one of them. So um, we um, welcomed capitalism and hypercapitalism with force, and we kind of push the history to the side as something that we don't really need to discuss um, because we are focusing on the futures. So creating these, some sort of, these sort of uh, historical interventions, interventions in time and asking people to stop and think um, has been good, I think, because it, it, it kind of created and formed conversations that don't really usually take place. I mean, they do tend to take place in academic contexts and um, in different kind of practices, but just with people who get on with their day to day, um, there's not enough kind of engagement. So for them, it's been quite useful just to kind of stop and think together. Okay, like, yeah, this has happened and what, what's happened since? <laughs> I don't know whether that's answers your question at yeah, all, but, yes, but the, the, the response has been different here to the way it has been at home, but uh, I mean, that's no one to blame, I mean, we just kind of relate to this history um, differently in terms of... Thank you. Yeah, I like the way you use the audio-visual mm. um, and the kind of looping mm -hmm. um, to kind of show the expression well in a way. Yeah, yeah, that was my kind of main concern because, like, we've got all this material, and I see so many, um, um, you know, 
people who don't really engage necessarily with politics, like elderly women, young children, young women coming onto the streets and kind of protesting together, something that we don't really have that as a culture even today. Um, so something kind of happened and something struck that they felt the need to kind of come out and support their community. And I think that was really important moment in time. But then we've got all this kind of material, the archive, the visual archives that um, just kind of captures a moment and then moves on to another protester, another face, another kind of being. And I was just like, let's stop. I want to know what this old woman is all about. Like, what's her struggle? Like, why is she here? What, what food has she brought? Anyway, yeah. Thank you. Hey, um, thank you so much for this. Um, you yeah, said um, in when you were just talking about the field kitchen residency, mm -hmm. uh, you said that you um, held daily improvisations. Mm -hmm. um, and you said that some of them were very successful. Um, I was wondering what success and improvisation means to you regarding your practice. Is um, it aesthetics or pleasure? Or pure joy, like pure feeling like the vibe is there. Um, not successful in terms of like, yeah, we produce something that's gonna like be a hit. Um, but no, like in the moment where you just like um, find that music or sharing um, kind of instruments uh, or whatever tools we have and playing with them in real time um, works as a form of communication with each other that is as productive as um, using words and that's why the participants um, and I kind of spent a lot of time just kind of playing and improvising because we just found that as a other way of communicating with each other and you know when you like talking to someone and you say like oh I'm having a really good conversation like this is really good we had that through sound um, that's what I mean by success Great. thank you Hello. Hey. Um, just want to ask you about um, your sort of themes of femini uh, femininity in your work. Of what, sorry? About feminism in your work. Mm -hmm. uh, and really just about, um, you talk about linear relationships and you talk about the non sort of linear nature of sound. Um, is that a reflection of your feminist thinking mm. uh, in sort of, you know, in the sense of d different ways of sort of approaching and thinking about, um, you know, sort of social issues? Yeah. Yeah, very much so. Um, it's kind of, um, to give an example, let's say um, the graphics course that I developed um, kind of move away from the traditional forms of uh, music reading and music scoring. So kind of t as a way to almost dissent or avoid this kind of linear, linear relationship between the uh, player and the sheet of music and actually say, saying um, there's no boundaries, there's no uh, borders, just read it how you want it to be read and how you um, can respond to in this particular moment in time. Um, so this idea of kind of openness and generosity uh, is really important element of my practice and I think that relates to the kind of feminist work I've been reading and the Le Guin's, um uh, Oliveira's approach, in particular. Well, Sandra, thank you uh, so much for for Thanks this for uh, talk. It, it's immensely inspirational when it comes to uh, some missing links in my work and um, that concern uh, feminist utopian thinking. I, I'm coming from the Tard um, project of utopian thinking. Gabriel Tardy was one to to write an underground man, one of the first sociologists, and I'm. Uh, currently researching festival grounds as uh, uh, liminal spaces, as, as, as ritual spaces. And um, one of the things that really concerns me um, is what you, you could call uh, the binary couple pollination and pollution. So I am researching festival grounds as contaminated spaces, as spaces of contamination that go in, in, in both directions, as fertile grounds, but al also as uh, 
contaminated space is due to, to like um, missile, missile testing. This is a common ground for very many like underground festival grounds. They are located in very perilous environments like Burning Man in Nevada or all the um, festivals in, in Israel, in the Negev des desert, in, in Germany, they are at the Polish uh, German border, all of them, the underground festival sites. So they are very heavily polluted, both through um, toxic gas, like Saccharum B from the, the world, uh, world War II, and later on, uh, missile testing to do to, uh, DDR. Um, so there was a lot of at atomic testing there. I would love to hear your thoughts about um, oral history, so is sonic history and abandonment, maybe also to, to sites like Chernobyl and, and, and music, you know. Um, uh -huh. what, what is your stance? Are there any thoughts uh, uh, about uh, this topic? Mm. You mean in terms of my practice? And yeah, mm -hmm. as an artist, but mm. also as a theory. Uh, mm -hmm. a theory. Mm -hmm. Well, kind of related back to um, the um, piece that I did, 13191. Um, it's, it is kind of a media archaeological piece, and it is very much relies on oral histories, or let's say audiovisual um, histories. And um, I kind of very much um, feed from these kind of materials and um, specifically with um, specifically by um, the kind of histories and archives that are not necessarily considered as uh, important and are seen as redundant um, and they don't have a place in the kind of historical narratives that are being constructed or told um, um, and I utilize that in in my work uh, I find it of an interest um, um, but in terms of yeah I'm just thinking how to connect so oral histories and sorry what else was it Our locations of contamination. Right, right, right. Okay, yes. Um, yeah, I think that's an interesting relationship to, to kind of explore. And specifically with um, the curatorial project that we did in CONUS um, for the CONUS Biennial um, and explored the uh, disused um, uh, textile factories um, um, to discover that uh, these actually spaces, these places were sites of contamination and the materials that were used were um, toxic um, and there were kind of cases and instances of specific illnesses that um, arose in, and people were developing illnesses by being subjected to those materials. Um, um, what they serve now, they're, they're, they're seen as redundant. They're not an interest to anyone, um, not even for um, urban planners or kind of uh, companies are not interested in these sites because they see them as more work than um, effort is worth it in terms of returns. So uh, back home we've got, um, you know, huge spaces dedicated to these huge textiles and as I said they're full of kind of different materials still that no one is actually interested in terms of doing anything with it and because these companies went bankrupt um, they've kind of gone to the government but the government also doesn't really know what to do with them um, um, so yeah this is something that could like obviously this is your research of interest and there's the relate the, the, the relationship and the connections between the two are very much present, but it hasn't really like caught my thinking. But yeah. 
Um, it's quite a basic question, but yeah. I noticed you haven't put um, any of the kind of conventional social media on on the slide. Do you have um, places where you um, like display your sound pieces uh. or or a name that you operate under, th which is which is like for sound production, where I could find things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you can, um, uh, if you go to my website, there's a link to my SoundCloud page, basically from there. Um, but I yeah, it's kind of uh, yeah, yeah. That that's it. I've got my website. <laughs> Okay, thank you. <laughs> Is that not enough? Do I need like <laughs> a Twitter handle? Um, I don't use Twitter, but yeah, my, my link to SoundCloud is on the website. Uh, and what else is out there in terms of social media? What else? Let me see. Oh, my name. Um, yeah, when I perform, I just usually use my, uh, my name, Sandra Carr. Um, it's just K and A because my surname is so long. Um, and um, I also kind of been developing uh, this new thing, DJ practice. So I still don't know how how I'm gonna call myself, but probably also with Sandra Carr, Sandy K. Okay. If there's no um, more questions, then um, I would just like to say thank you for San to thank Sandra for, for coming to me. share with her practice with us. Thank you for sticking around for this time.